Have you ever wondered how theories are made? What sort of work has gone into the development of quantum mechanics or special relativity, for example? How do we know we're right? And is it always a simple yes or no question? In this video, I'll talk a bit about what theories actually are and how we think of them in physics. As a PhD student, I am learning above all else how to be a scientist, that is to say, a, pra a practitioner of science. Now, science is built on the scientific method, five steps that allow us to systematically gain knowledge of the physical world around us. And the steps are that first we make an observation of something we can't explain. Then we create a hypothesis to try and explain it. Then we need to design and conduct experiments to gather relevant data. Then we do analysis on the data such that we can finally uh, test our hypothesis. So through the scientific method, we can go from seeing something we've never seen before to being able to predict what would happen without even having seen, without even ever having seen the observation. Now, I work a lot on the testing part of the scientific method. And working in nuclear physics, we are trying to explain and predict all nuclear phenomena and uh, matter we see in nature such as, for example, the elements of the periodic table, there's nuclear fusion in the sun, and there's also more exotic things, like neutron stars. Now, you might think that we've been able to explain most of this already, considering it's already written about in many school books, and on, even a lot on Wikipedia, for example. However, there's still a lot of things we can't explain. Uh, the biggest problem is that we don't fully understand how, the fundament, how nuclear particles interact with each other. And that is essential for us to be able to predict how systems of those nuclear particles would behave in nature. Of course, this does not mean that we're clueless. We have a lot of, we have a lot of well-tested ideas that work very well. Some of them are theories that expand on the standard model of particle physics, which is our most complete understanding of the fundamental building blocks of nature. So if the theory works here and there and sometimes and sometimes not, how do, does that mean it's wrong? Should we disregard it? To answer that question, we need to understand the concept of a theory and how, and, uh, how we think of them. Everyone has an idea of what theories are. A theory should be a well-established framework that helps us understand something in the physical world. For example, quantum mechanics works great at predicting the physics of individual quantum particles. Special relativity works wonderfully at explaining how two different reference frames moving at different velocities see the time evolution of the same event. But what if I tell you that quantum mechanics usually does not include special relativity? Does that mean that quantum mechanics is wrong simply because it doesn't include relativistic effects? Well, no. It makes quantum mechanics a theory that works wonderfully at non-relativistic velocities. The relativistic effects are still there, but they're so small that quantum mechanics still works. So if a theory works uh, here and there and sometimes and sometimes not, how do we know it's correct? The answer to this lies with the scientific method and the definition of a theory. A theory was a hypothesis that has been well tested and can predict reality repeatedly. And quantum mechanics does exactly this. It can predict reality, and it has done so well for 100 years. So there's no extra demand on a theory that says it should predict everything from quantum particles to galaxies. Such a theory would be called a theory of everything. And there's even doubt as to whether or not it can exist. Another option would be to have a theory of theories, where each sub-theory uh, stuck to the same framework or format but predicted different things. Regardless of these all-encompassing theories, a theory itself is only supposed to predict what it is intended to predict. But what happens if it doesn't? What if one day quantum mechanics couldn't explain an observation we made of quantum physics? Well, then it's our, job as, our jobs as scientists to expand and improve our theory, rather than just trying to replace it with a new one. And you can think of this a bit as trying to expand on a building. You don't just immediately put a whole new building on top of it or tear it down and replace it with a new one. What you do instead 
is that you can, for example, put another floor on it. Now, the new floor, I mean, we don't change anything in the floors below. That still works. We just added another floor to account for something new. However, this raises another question. Can we always just add another floor? Are theories infinitely improvable? Or if they're not, how do we know they aren't? How do we know we simply haven't been clever enough when extending our theory? To answer this, I think we can look at an example. Let's propose that the Earth is flat. And let's say it works pretty well. Everything around us, everything we initially see, fits with our, hypo our hypothesis, and we start to feel confident enough to call it a theory. Then, one day, a PhD student decides to try and explain why the sun sets at different times at different places. For example, here in Gothenburg, the sun can set at six, set at six o'clock, but it doesn't set for another seven hours in New York. So first, the, uh, the student suggests, ah, okay, well, maybe the sun is going in as a lamp swaying above this disk, illuminating different places at different times. But the problem with that is that the sun would never go below the horizon. We wouldn't have a sunset. So instead, the student says, okay, well, the sun is going around the disk, such that it's below the disk at nighttime. But then the sun wouldn't set at different times in different places. We'd all see it at the same time. And as the student tried to expand on this theory of a flat Earth, keep coming up with new modifications to try and explain this sunset problem, the student realized that this is not going to work out. So the student attempted, to, uh, the student decided to disregard the theory and try a new hypothesis, a different shape for the Earth. And after a bit of trial and error, the student suggested a huge sphere, where everything locally would look flat, but globally, the sunset would be encapsulated beautifully by the theory, well, hypothesis. And as more and more scientists started using this new idea, and more experimental data came in and fit with the hypothesis, the, th the scientific community started adopting this new theory instead. So, in this example, I have a question. Was the original theory wrong? It certainly didn't explain the sunset problem, but that wasn't the original point either. The problem was calling the, flat, calling the theory a flat Earth theory, saying that it involved all of Earth. It was only a theory that worked on a, on a smaller scale where we couldn't see the curvature. And not knowing of the curvature, the student was forced to rely on constant theoretical failures, further, further uh, increasing his disbelief in the theory itself. To put it in the context of my building example, the, th the student was trying to add another floor to a building that could not support it, no matter what shape the floor took. However, there's nothing wrong with the theory of a flat earth or a, a flat surface itself. We still use the idea of a flat surface in the construction of maps. So the student learned that the theory was wrong. And it may have been that the student simply wasn't being clever enough in expanding the theory. But after so many failures, it seemed more promising to tr attempt a new hypothesis, to invest time in a new hypothesis, rather than keep expanding on an old theory. And that's the fine border that's very difficult, very difficult in science. And we've certainly seen our fair share of that kind of research in physics. We've had many failures and many, fa many failures of theories and many failures of theoretical extensions. So perhaps a more interesting question is, what was our success story and where are we today? The example encompasses how we think of theory development in science. Theory extension is exactly how the standard model of particle physics grew into existence. We started out wanting to explain the atomic nucleus. But our only, our only theory at the time was with electromagnetism for how two particles interact. However, the nucleus consists, a nucleus consists of positively charged and neutrally charged particles called protons and neutrons. But when you only have positively charged particles, your core is repulsive. It would fly apart. You, will have, you have no plus and minus, you have only plus. 
And at the same time, we can't remove the electromagnetic force from our theory because we use it also for electrons in, for example, atoms and molecules. So what we did instead was suggest a new force, a nuclear force working between protons and neutrons alone that would keep the nucleus together. And it worked really well in predicting, predicting experiment. But we did see some shortcomings in some nuclear decays, so our original theory of one nuclear force was divided into two, into a strong and a weak nuclear force. And today, the, electromagnet the electromagnetic, strong and weak forces have all been merged together into one collective theory called the standard model of particle physics. So this brings us back to nuclear physics. We know that there are still some problems with our extensions of the standard model used in nuclear physics. At the same time, we know that the standard model of particle physics works really well in particle physics, and we've seen much of that success also in nuclear physics. So just because our theory has some problems shouldn't, doesn't mean that we should disregard the theory we based it on, or our we should disregard our theoretical extensions of the underlying theory. We may just need to expand it a bit. So to wrap up this video, I would just like to say that even though your theory has some problems, doesn't mean that it's wrong. It may just be a bit incomplete. This was a popular science presentation from Chalmers University of Technology in Sweden.